In the case of the Toronto newspapers, efficiency is increased even further through the use of computers to perform an operation called justifying the lines, which means they control the spacing of letters so that both sides of a column have a margin. They can do it much faster and with fewer mistakes than any human. That's just one industry. The fact is, automation is wiping out jobs at an almost breathtaking rate. In the United States, it eliminates 36,000 jobs every week. In Britain, it's been estimated that 10 million new jobs will have to appear by 1970 to avoid calamitous unemployment. In Canada, we'll have to find two and a half to three million in the next six years, four or five times as many as have been created in the past six. And still, very few people are concerned. Like the printers, they think it won't happen to them. But automation has affected everyone's day-to-day -day life. Here are just a couple of examples. Did you want first class or economy? Ever take a plane trip? It used to take an agonizingly long time to get a plane reservation, but automation has made it simple and fast. 15 September, is that correct, Mr. Simeon? The clerk simply ticks off a few things on a punched card, sticks the card into a slot, and computers take over from there. In an average time of one and a half seconds, the computer records the information on the card, checks to see if it's accurate, finds out whether a seat is available, and notifies the clerk that everything is okay or not, as the case may be. TCA installed their computer system two years ago. It cost $4 million, which sounds like a lot of money, but the system might very well have paid for itself by now. If only one additional passenger is shoehorned onto each TCA flight, the airline's revenue will go up by $2 million. Another heavily computerized operation affecting your daily life, the telephone system. Automation has made it possible for you to call another city by dialing 13 digits, in some cases only 10, and never speaking to an operator. Computers record your number, the number you're calling, choose the best route for the call to take, and record the length of the call and the amount you should be billed, all in a few seconds. Without this equipment, it's been estimated, the phone company would need to hire virtually every female of working age in the country. We've been talking a lot about automation and what it will do, but we still haven't given you a concise definition, what it really is. And we thought the best man to go to for that would be the man who invented the word. He's John Diebold, an American, 37 years old, who's president of his own company with 14 branches on three continents. He confesses he coined the word automation because he's a poor speller and he didn't like working out the original word automatization, and as he says, it's hard to say just what it does mean. It's getting increasingly more difficult to answer because people are applying the word so very widely, but fundamentally it's, it's a technological development that um, has at its heart the ability to handle and communicate information automatically and the ability to build machine systems to do this. And We use the information for the guidance of military devices is where it started, or we use it to, to um, guide machine tools and factory equipment. You use it in the form of the computer for handling information in the office, and we're finding, I think, each day many, many new areas where information it plays an important role in our lives that we hadn't realized before, and we start applying these new fruits of science to, to this, and that process of application is called automation. Next, our reporter asked Mr. Diebold how to cope with the implications of automation without a large government involvement, a prospect looked on with high disapproval by most capitalists. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question, because I believe that um, we automatically tend to assume that public policy uh, means government action. I don't think it means that at all. I think government is one element, but I think that labor, I think that uh, business, and I think that the consumer are all determinants of public policy. I'm thinking more of the difficulties of individual companies and corporations and individual labor unions getting together and being able to to operate and, and plan as as one body anyway. 
I think the place that the planning, I think that the, the, the premium on planning is to find out what is likely to happen and then to try to determine today, the consequences of it today. For example, if you're going to have many job shifts, you're going to have many, many shifts in skill, abilities over a period of time, there's a great premium on changing the educational system to adapt to this, to handle it. And uh, that gives everyone a better idea of what needs to be done. Planning in that sense, I'm very much for. Mm -hmm. I now, don't think there's any inevitability about further state direction mm -hmm. of, of these efforts. I think that the, 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 the um, emphasis, though, should be on finding out what the consequences are. For example, in automation, the social consequences and human consequences are enormous, enormous, enormous. These, these are, um, machines have always been important to us, um, primarily as, 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 as a means of producing social change. The real importance has, in the end, always been that they precipitated great social change. And that's going to be true in spades for this new development. This can be true enormously. For the impact of automation on Canada, we went to Dr. Joseph Cates, president of a management consultant firm in Toronto, and one of the most foremost authorities on computers. The first thing we asked him was how far along the road toward a push-button life we'd got so far. Well, uh, we can consider three classes of aid. And the first one is where companies are using it uh, to uh, do the paperwork prior to production, what is called production planning and production control. That's where they work out what they should be producing, how, when, how much. Uh, there's a tremendous uh, uh, progress in introducing computers in this field. I'd say right now most large Canadian companies either already have advanced quite far in using computers for production control or they are well on their way of preparing to introduce computers into production control. Now the second uh, uh, class of applications is uh, uh, where companies are using computers to actually control machines. Uh, the one uh, that people hear most about is machine tools. Uh, there is some introduction of computers in, into actually operating machine tools and machines, but that's relatively small right now. Uh, I don't know the exact statistics, but that hazard a guess that it's less than 5% of the potential applications. Finally, there is the situation that uh, has been discussed where computers may control parts or entire factories or parts of uh, factories and this is uh, more in the thinking stage than in a realized, uh, I'd say I don't know of any factories or plants uh, that are completely controlled by computers. There are proportions of especially chemical and oil plants that are now controlled by computers, but uh, so far the proportion is extremely minuscule, not even 1% of uh, plants. What do you think we can expect in the future? How quickly do you think computerized operations will, will take over? Uh, I think we are going to see fairly rapid expansion of computerized control uh, in the next decade. I'd say at the end of the next decade, every large company is going to use computers for production control, the first class.